Good afternoon, good time, uh, everyone. Uh, we st um, we've just uh, started this webinar. The system is now um, adding people progressively and not all at the same time. So I'm just keeping a track of, of, of the count here. But I believe I can already start uh, welcoming you all uh, to this session, uh, the CEO conversation organized by the Society of International Economic Law. I'm here representing the uh, executive committee of the Society of International Economic Law. Um, as you know, the, the president uh, is uh, Peter van den Bosche, and uh, the vice presidents are at the moment uh, uh, Isabel van Damme and uh, Marcus Wagner. So I thank you both all of them for, for helping me organize this and all the other members of the executive committee. So uh, I, this uh, we have here a stellar team of participants who are going to be discussing the outcome of the, or the outcomes of the uh, 12th ministerial conference just happened in Geneva, finished uh, last week. Uh, and uh, I will just uh, introduce to you our moderator and she will introduce the rest of you. The moderator is uh, uh, Irina Polovets. She is uh, now uh, advisor to the uh, DDG, Angela Ellard, but she has a long history in the WTO. She was worked both at the Legal Affairs Division and in the Department of Secretariat. Uh, she's been in a Ukrainian law firm. She has a master's from uh, the WTI, the World Trade Institute, and uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, and so uh, with that introduction done, I give the floor to Irina to introduce the other participants. Thank you. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And thank you very much, Geraldo, for the introduction. A thanks to the Society of International Economic Law for inviting me to moderate this session on MC12 outcomes. Uh, as Geraldo said, we have a stellar panel of experts here with us today, which includes uh, former and current WTO insiders and representatives. So let me start by introducing them. Um, first, Annabel Gonzalez. She's a Deputy Director General at the World Trade Organization. And previously, she served as Minister of Foreign Trade of Costa Rica, Senior Director of the Global Practice on Trade and Competitiveness at the World Bank, Director of the Agriculture and Commodities Division at the WTO, Senior Consultant at the Inter-American Development Bank, and finally, as non-resident fellow with the Peterson Institute for International Economics, where she also hosted the Trade Winds program. Bernard Hochman is Professor and Director uh, of the Global Economics Program at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute in Florence. And prior to that, he was director of the International Trade Department and research manager in the development research group of the World Bank. And he also served as an economist in the GATT Secretariat. Peter Omphakorn has been reporting on MC12 negotiations at his blog, the Trade Beta blog that I think many of you know. And he also worked in the Information and External Relations Division of the WTO Secretariat from 1996 to 2015. And last but not least, of course, Victor Do Prado. Until recently, he was a director of the Council and Trade Negotiations Committee at the WTO. He also served as Deputy Chief of Staff to the WTO Deputy Director General Pascal Lamy. And he's a former diplomat and negotiator and a member of Brazilian negotiating team at the end of the Uruguay round. Currently, Victor is a senior fellow at the Brazilian Center for International Relations. Thank you to all of you for joining us today for this event. If you would like to pose a question to our panelists, please do so using the Q&A box. And we will turn to your questions um, in the second part of the discussion. So MC12 is the first ministerial the WTO had in five years. And while in light of the geopolitical tensions and the general, and the general geopolitical climate, the expectations for this ministerial were quite low, the stakes were extremely high. In her opening speech, the WTO Director General said that if members managed to deliver on one of the issues that were before them, MC12 would be a success. And I think it would be fair to say that the results have exceeded our expectations because WTO members have managed to deliver on the majority of issues that were before them. First of all, members have added a new agreement 
the agreement on fishery subsidies to the WTO rulebook. And it's the second fully fledged WTO agreement added to the rulebook after the Uruguay round, in addition to the trade facilitation agreement. And it's the very first agreement with the environmental sustainability at its core. In addition, we've got two decisions to address the pandemic related issues. One of these decisions is on the TRIPS agreement, and the second one is on the trade related aspects of the response to the pandemic, such as export restrictions, regulatory cooperation and trade facilitation. We've got two decisions on food security, and of course, we've got the outcome document that sets the direction for future work of the WTO and commits WTO members to work on WTO reform. The fact that members managed to get these outcomes despite rising geopolitical tensions and even the war in Ukraine um, shows that members can put aside non-trade related issues and focus on issues of global commons, such as the pandemic, food security, and other related issues. And this, of course, gives hope for future WTO negotiations, as well as work of other international organizations on issues such as climate change. So today we will discuss these and other outcomes of MC12, as well as the road ahead post MC12. Without further ado, uh, perhaps I could start with Annabelle. Annabelle, as someone who was in the thick of the MC12 negotiations, could you please briefly walk us through the outcomes and what they mean for the organization, for its members and for multilateralism overall? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irina, uh, to you, Geraldo, and Ciel more broadly. It's a pleasure to, you, to join you and uh, so many friends and colleagues uh, today. So it was encouraging uh, to see ministers stepping up the plate uh, at the ministerial and delivering on nearly everything we were working on. Uh, at the start of the session, we were expecting one, uh, perhaps uh, two deliverables, and instead we got more than six. And the outcomes turn out to be not only numerous, uh, but I believe important. Uh, the common thread uh, across all of them is that they address uh, pressing issues faced by people and businesses in today's world, uh, from the pandemic to the looming food crisis, to the health of our oceans and the digital transformation. So let me highlight uh, a few. First, on response to the pandemic, the most important and contentious part of the outcome clarifies and streamlines the scope for governments to limit patent rights for COVID-19 vaccines to help diversify manufacture, vaccine manufacturing capacity to make supplies more resilient and access more equitable. The other part of the pandemic related outcome uh, addresses uh, trade measures such as export restrictions, trade facilitation and regulatory cooperation to keep trade in vital medical products open and supply chains running in this and future pandemics. On food and security, members agreed to exempt the World Food Program uh, food purchases from export curbs, and they took steps to make trade in food, fertilizers, and other agricultural inputs easier and more predictable, which is especially important in times like now uh, when global supplies are tight and high prices threaten poor households around the world. On digital trade, members committed not to impose customs duties on electronic transmissions, allowing for electronically transmitted trade from movies and eBooks to software and other uh, digitally delivered business services to continue to move freely across borders. Failing to agree on the moratorium, which has been in place since 1998, would have been a double blow to the global services and digital economy and the millions of jobs and businesses that depend on it worldwide, and to the WTO and its efforts to bring its rule book up to date. Turning to the issue of sustainability, uh, WTO members successfully concluded an agreement with environmental protection at its core for the first time in the 28 years uh, of history of the organization. The agreement prohibits subsidies for illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing operations and for fishing of overexploited stocks. And it prohibits subsidies for fishing on the high seas that are not managed by regional fisheries bodies. This is a significant outcome, not just for fish, but for the millions of people around the world who depend on fish for food and income. 
On sustainability, we saw another significant, though little noticed outcome. It was the recognition in the outcome document of the three planetary crises of our time, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, and the role of the multilateral trading system in tackling them. This is the first time climate change and other environmental challenges are explicitly mentioned in a multilaterally agreed declaration at the WTO, signaling, I think, a growing appetite by all members to engage more proactively and constructively on this key issue in the WTO. And then, of course, there is arguably the most uh, important outcome of all, uh, the decision of ministers to set in motion the work to reform the WTO. And that means addressing all WTO functions, uh, not least the challenges and concerns related to the dispute settlement, including the appellate body, so that we can have a, a fully and well-functioning dispute settlement system by 2024. Now, you also ask about what these outcomes mean for the WTO, and let me highlight a couple of things. The first, I think, relates to trust. Going into the ministerial, the level of trust among members looked uh, decisively low, and nobody knew exactly how geopolitical drift would play out during the conference. And yet, amid uh, geopolitical uh, headwinds, ministers were able to carve out a space for my multilateral consensus building, however small, which I think is remarkable. That does not mean, of course, that we have turned the page on years of mistrust uh, between members, but I now, I now see more fertile ground to overcome the trust deficit and develop a stronger sense of common purpose among WTO members. And this will be essential if we want to make progress on the task of reforming the WTO. The other issue that I'd like to highlight is confidence in multilateralism. So the ministerial came at a pivotal and fragile time for the global trading system, burdened as it is with overlapping and compounding crises and threats. And failure to deliver would have dealt a serious blow to the prospects of the WTO reform, putting the future of the organization at risk. So success, on the other hand, has given a shot of confidence to the WTO after years of gloom. Ministers managed to push back against the perception that multilateral trade cooperation has run its course. So as success breeds success, uh, and the confidence we gain at the ministerial will stand us in good stead to deliver even more in the future, I am hopeful. Thank you, Annabelle, uh, for this comprehensive overview. If I may now turn to the procedural aspects of MC12. Um, MC12 was probably a ministerial like no other. It took place in Geneva at the WTO headquarters, and it may have been one of the longest that we've had. We finished in the wee hours of Friday instead of Wednesday afternoon. And I know that there were quite a few other um, innovations compared to previous ministerials, such as, for example, using pre-recorded statements in lieu of an in-person plenary session. So for those, for those of us who didn't attend the ministerial in person, could you please elaborate on how this ministerial was different from the previous one and whether this contributed to its success? So I think you're right, Irina, that by the time the conference closed on Friday, we were all running on empty after many long days and even longer nights, uh, but I think the effort was uh, uh, well worth it. Now, each ministerial takes a life of its own and they all become unique in their own way. Uh, in this case, I could highlight the perseverance and grit of the Director General, Dr. Ngozio Konjo Iwala, as instrumental in steering ministers uh, away from stalemate and in the direction of success or minister's pragmatism and willingness to compromise, uh, which was not necessarily evident in the beginning, but was at full display, for example, in the decision to take an incremental approach to deal with uh, rules on fishery subsidies, or the hands-on role, uh, hands role of the secretariat, myself and the DG included, in facilitating members reaching agreement on the most controversial issue of intellectual property well before the ministerial gathering took place and then throughout. Now, more than that, however, and there are many other things that uh, you pointed uh, to, to one of them, for example, but more than that, I would like to focus uh, and maybe deviate just a bit from, from your question 
on the systemic innovations of MC12, as I think they have the potential for a greater impact on the way forward. First, in the intellectual property decision, there is an inconspicuous footnote, footnote one, the purpose of which is to define the countries that can benefit from the flexibilities included in the intellectual property deal. In doing so, it creates an opt-out mechanism that could serve as a blueprint for dealing with a very thorny issue, which is the differentiation among the WTO's increasingly diverse membership. Footnote one was jointly negotiated by the United States and China, and unsurprisingly, it was the last piece of the ministerial to fall into place. Now, that opt-out uh, could work in two ways, in my view. First, it supports the adoption of responsibilities by emerging markets in the global trading system. And while the footnote declares that all developing countries are eligible, it also encourages countries with existing capacity to manufacture COVID-19 vaccines to make a binding commitment to opt out of the decision. And China did that. And second, the opt-out in footnote one of the IP decision also works to facilitate multilateral out outcomes by allowing those members that cannot join a particular outcome to stay out, bringing much needed flexibility to the global trading system. Another innovation I want to briefly highlight is the sunset clause in the fish subsidies agreement. The sunset clause says that the whole agreement lapses if a more comprehensive deal is not achieved within four years of entry into force or members agree to keep it. So the sunset clause provides a powerful incentive to build on and improve the existing agreement that was reached on this critically important issue. So footnote one and the sunset clause were key to the delivering the IP and the fisheries deals respectively. And in going forward, I think they also po uh, point to the need for creative thinking like that of MC12 to continue to steer the WTO through the bumpy, bumpy and unpredictable road that lies ahead. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, Victor, I would like to turn to you now. As someone who until very recently was in the WTO and is now looking at MC12 and what's happening in the WTO from an outsider's perspective, how would you assess the outcomes of MC12? And if is there anything that stands out to you? Thank you, uh, Irina, and uh, hello to everyone. I'm delighted to participate in, in this panel uh, with uh, good friends um, uh, and, and discuss something that is close to my heart, uh, as, as you all uh, know. Um, on your specific question, um, Irina, uh, as you know, I lived a long time in Canton de Vaux in, um, in Switzerland, where Peter also lives now. And in Canton de Vaux, they have this uh, funny uh, phrase uh, in French that says, je suis déçu en bien. Uh, I'm disappointed in, uh, for the good. Uh, as you said, Irina, uh, the expectations were very low. Um, so therefore, the results uh, are all the more welcome. Um, really, really welcome. Uh, and um, I keep thinking to myself in these days, even if you remove the effects of the war uh, in Ukraine, the economic troubles, the lingering pandemic, um, which um, make the result all, all the more um, impressive, even if you remove, you know, artificially from your mind, all of that, it's still very welcome because uh, the WTO um, didn't raise a lot of expectations in a lot of quarters. Um, so uh, great result, and I want to uh, commend Annabelle and, and all of the uh, senior management uh, in the WTO and the members, of course, who came, uh, who came together for, uh, for, this, uh, for this great um, result. Now, having said all of this, and you, you all know me, it could always have been better. So let's, let's say there are things that could have been better, but it's great to have a result. And amongst the things that could have been better um, and that are not there, and Annabelle didn't mention it specifically, uh, but I think it's uh, in the minds of a lot of people, um, is agriculture. Um, there was no uh, agreement on agriculture in spite of the huge efforts um, of the chair uh, of uh, the uh, special session of the Committee on Agriculture, Ambassador Gloria Abraham. Um, so there's no resolution to the very contentious issue of 
public stock holding, um, and uh, no advancement in terms of the disciplines on agricultural subsidies or in agricultural market access. Um, what does this mean for the future is, is a question mark. And, and for many countries, this is, uh, this is very important. Um, there is, of course, an impressive uh, list of uh, decisions that uh, Annabelle uh, described. And amongst them, I would like to highlight the fisheries agreement, but we all know that the fisheries agreement fell somewhat short of the expectation of many. It's still impressive, huh? and I completely agree. It's great to have that agreement. I mean, it's, it's a first step, but it does contain a provision um, that is, I hope it's not a double-edged sword, which is the sunset clause. It's a very interesting um, tool in, in, a, in a novel toolbox of WTO tricks, um, as Annabelle said, there was the um, opt-out uh, footnote in the uh, TRIPS decision and this sunset clause. Um, I myself have a, a, a bit of a, an allergy to, to, a, to language that gives me uh, recollection. I mean, the language in the sunset clause in fisheries is exactly the language of the textiles agreement, which was meant to make sure that that agreement would not ever be prolonged. Um, so that language was used in a rather different context, whereas the hope now is that this agreement will be extended and will be, um, uh, will be enhanced and, and improved. So let's, let's hope for that. So I guess uh, here, um, a lot of these tricks have a political importance much more than a legal importance. And that political importance, again, I want to highlight, needs to be welcome. I mean, the, uh, the opt-out uh, clause is, is novel in a way. There were things like in the trade facilitation agreement, the different categories of countries. Um, there were uh, members of the WTO, such as Costa Rica, for example, um, that uh, unilaterally declared they would not avail themselves of special and differential treatment. It's nice to see this in a draft uh, agreement that was, that was adopted. Um, and let's hope that this will, um, this will uh, inspire members to come up with new tricks uh, because God knows we, uh, we need them. Um, a final word uh, on reform, um, I think, uh, again, it's great to have that declaration. Uh, when you read the text of the outcome document, and I was still in the WTO when that was being negotiated, um, it has something for everyone, which is great. Uh, however, the differences were not resolved, and you would not expect that to happen now. So a lot of work ahead. I guess that is the final, uh, the final conclusion that I come. What MC12 did is indeed give them a boost, um, a breath of, um, of uh, new breath to the WTO, but there is surely uh, great, great work uh, ahead um, to make sure that, uh, that the WTO thrives and uh, that the trends that we were seeing before uh, the um, the ministerial do not uh, materialize. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And if I could just zoom in specifically on the TRIPS agreement outcome. Um, as we know, this decision was criticized by both the representatives of the pharma industry on the one hand and the public health NGOs on the other hand. Um, the former argue that it sends a dangerous signal to the pharma industry and may discourage future innovation while the latter criticize its lack of ambition. Um, in your view, does the fact that both sides seem to be equally unhappy indicate that in fact it might be a balanced outcome or do you think any of that criticism is warranted? Well, let's put it this way. This is an, this is an agreement that was absolutely necessary. And uh, we know how much time Annabelle spent on, 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 this, uh, on this outcome. Uh, the, so I don't want to evaluate whether it's um, good or bad. Uh, it, it was necessary. And the fact that it is there, I think needs to be, needs to be welcome. Now, it has a huge political importance. 
Um, I am less sure about the, the legal consequences, uh, but still it's, it's important to have it, um, to make sure that people see how the WTO can respond to these challenges. Uh, now, we know that the effect on the ground may not be uh, overwhelming. Uh, you read the news these days and you see there are countries, including developing countries. I was talking to a, a former colleague in South Africa who told me South Africa is discarding vaccines uh, because they are not being used. No, there's no there's no market for them, um, which is which is a strange thing happening um, today if you compare to a year or two years ago. So, again, huge political importance. Um, let's see how, you know, this influences or not uh, the market. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Peter, I would now like to turn to you and um, to turn our discussion to what, what, the future, what, what is in the future for some of the MC12 outcomes. So um, some commentators have characterized MC12 outcomes as setting the table for future work or even being partial outcomes. In your view, what needs to be done to cement these outcomes and what are the next steps for WTO members after MC12? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be on this uh, panel. I, I would first like to um, say that I agree with a lot of the, particularly the positive points that were raised by Annabel and Victor. And, and, and therefore, if I sound negative, let's not forget. Um, that, that there are those are there and they're very important about the future work I would I would say that this is a reality it's not particularly new to this conference because putting a signature on an agreement is never the end of the story the deal has to be implemented and monitored so if you go down the list of 10 decisions and declarations every single one requires further work in some cases, there's more negotiation needed, the fishery subsidies we've talked about, the, the intellectual property waiver negotiations and whether to add other products or not. Um, it's also implied in some of the things that people are talking about, for example, the plurilaterals, the negotiations amongst only a subgroup of the membership because consensus amongst the full membership is, is not possible at this stage. So, so the negotiations that, that lie ahead there, in all 10 cases, there's implementation. And in one case, there's ratification. The fishery subsidies agreement will not take effect until two thirds of the members have ratified it. And what very few people know is that it won't take effect in any of the countries that have not ratified it, even after the two thirds is reached. So if we want this agreement to, to apply to all WTO members, that means all WTO members have to ratify it. And the third area of future work, which is a really important part of the WTO, is transparency. Um, that is crucial. And all 10 also require transparency, even including the two moratoriums indirectly, there's, there's transparency involved in that. I would then, looking at the future, I would then come to what I would describe as the two failed agreements. and and. Um, Victor has already alluded to the agriculture negotiations. This was an innocuous text. It was a work program, um, but it was binned because there was no consensus on it. And that is a warning for the future, not only in agriculture, but in all the other subjects that they can still be blocked by consensus that few of us will understand because e e even on something as, as innocuous as agriculture, it can happen. The other area is not exactly a failure in the sense that it's missing, but it's just far too vague. And in a sense, this replies to one of the questions from Elliot Ducey, I think, in, in the Q&A. It's WTO, WTO reform. It is far too vague. People have welcomed the fact that it's mentioned, but as I think Victor said, nobody's agreed on what it means and what will be included. So we can expect members to spend months just debating what goes on the agenda of WTO reform. And even on dispute settlement, there's only a date. There's not even a statement that says we will revive the appellate body. So I think there's a lot that lies ahead in that, that, that is hidden behind what looks like a success. So what needs to be done? What needs to be done is continued engagement, not 
believing, leaving the ministerial saying job done. The purpose of the in-person ministerial conference was to try and improve connections and communications within members and between members. And the onus, as some of us have been arguing all along after the ministerial conference is to keep that going. And the onus is in the capitals, not in Geneva. So it's up to the ministers and the, their capital-based officials to continue to, to, to engage on this and to engage with the Geneva delegates who are not necessarily always on the same page as their colleagues in the capitals. One very vivid example is what the Indian minister uh, said to Indian journalists on the final day. He said he was completely satisfied with the, agri the outcome on agriculture because it ha would have no effect on India's ability to provide price support for their stockholding programs. Now, this is the exact opposite of what the Indian delegations have been saying since 2014. And in fact, it's the opposite of what the minister himself said in his statement to the ministerial conference. And that is a really extreme example, but there are similar disconnects between the different parts of, of, of the membership within and between the members um, in, in, in other areas. So it's not new. Um, you could also say that, that one thing that was lacking was the kind of engagement that, that the US had provided previously um, in showing leadership in, in, in certain activities. So you can't say job done, you can't drop the ball, and you can't just move on to other things like free trade agreements. That would be an abdication of responsibility in my view. Thank you very much, Peter. And just to continue with this topic of um, WTO reform, uh, Bernard, I know that you've done a lot of work on this. And um, in the outcome document, of course, members have agreed to work on WTO reform to improve all the three functions of the organization. But what would constitute reform is very much in the eye of the beholder. And probably different groups of members would see the reform differently. Um, in your view, what should be the top three priorities for the WTO reform? Uh, well, let me just start by saying thanks for the invitation. I find it extremely, uh, let's see, positive that there are so many people on this call. I think one ago that shows that the institution definitely isn't dead, at least in this community. The question is uh, not a straight, not an easy one. So I'm going to have four, if we can, and, but I'll keep it short. So the first one is is to strengthen the deliberative function of the organization, and I think it's pretty clear from seeing what's happening to U.S. trade policy at the moment. Um, in various countries, there is less and less appetite for traditional trade agreements. Right? It's certainly not dead. Uh, we see lots of countries negotiating trade agreements. But increasingly, there's a focus on we need to do something else. We need to focus on particular issues. We need to think modular. We need to think about cooperating on regulatory types of issues. These are matters that really do not lend themselves to the mercantilist give and take of a traditional uh, trade agreement and trade negotiation. So that really requires, a, and you're already seeing it, right? So this is not new. But I think from WTO reform perspective, I would argue, there needs to be more of a focus on actually supporting this process, helping members figure out what actually are good regulatory practices, not as defined by the OECD, but in the context of the membership where we have a lot of developing countries, which are not necessarily the focus of these types of discussions in the OECD context. That requires greater transparency. That requires a lot more analysis of the spillover effects of policies, right? So that deliberative process really needs to be informed by much more meat and substance in terms of what are we talking about? What are the implications of alternatives? And currently that is all left on the plate of the membership insofar as members want to do this. So I think the secretariat has a much greater role to play here. I understand the internal political economy, but I think if the organization is going to remain relevant to this emerging and new agenda, and also kind of help members understand what is going on in other fora, in other contexts, 
among members who are doing things in the context of regional integration or who are negotiating digital partnership agreements, what have you. There needs to be much more exchange between that and what, and what is being discussed in the WTO. And that requires uh, a, a secretary that is, simply has the mandate to do that, right? So I think that that's an important part of the reform agenda. And you can talk about individual issues. Subsidies would be a good example where we simply don't have enough of that information. We haven't done the analysis. There are lots of allegations being bandied back and forth about how this is a distortion or that is anti-competitive, but there's not a whole lot of evidence to underpin a lot of this. My second one would be dispute settlement, right? So clearly we don't have an operating dispute settlement mechanism at the moment. We all know why. But I think it's really important to start from where we are and really think about and create mechanisms to actually think about, okay, what would make for an effective dispute settlement mechanism that deals with some of the concerns that have been raised by the United States. But I think it's fair to say that there are many countries that can identify ways in which they would like to see the system improved, right? So I think that is a process that needs to take place. There's lots of ideas out there. Uh, obviously, it requires engagement by the United States, but I would argue that it requires as, as much it requires engagement by the rest of the membership. And I am not inside the House. I don't know exactly what has been going on, but as an outsider, my sense is there has been insufficient thinking about what those alternatives might look like, right? There has been too much of a focus. Bring back the, the appellate body. Bring back the appellate body. It's not going to happen. Right? So we need to think about where, where to go on this. But I think also equally important on, on conflict resolution is to build on innovations that have occurred within the WTO already. Right? So we know about the specific trade concerns, type of mechanism. So I think part of the reform process really needs to focus on trying to use the committees, WTO bodies more effectively as a way of actually putting things on the table where there are potential problems thinking about potential solutions. And again, that's not new. We have it in SBS, we have it in TBT. I think that really is something that could and should be generalized. But there again, we need a lot more analysis of what are the spillover effects of these policies that a country might have a concern with. So I think part of the reform effort, and I'll admit to my bias, I'm an economist, right? Probably one of the few on this call, but I think we, we think about this too much in a legalistic way. We really need to think about it more as on, in terms of what are the effects of, of policies that might cause problems for other countries. Third is to regularize plurinationals, right? And here I'm not talking about the GPA, I'm talking about the joint statement initiative type of engagement, where ultimately a lot of what is going to come out of this are open agreements, open in the sense that in principle, non-discriminatory, anybody can join, but not everybody is expected to join, right? And I guess everybody on this call knows what the issues there are in terms of the WTO, not really providing a very accommodating environment to include those types of agreements in the structure of, uh, of the WTO. But I think that's an important dimension where we form really should focus because that is, again, that's the direction of travel. That's what we're seeing outside the WTO happening. So the WTO has to become much more accommodative of these types of initiatives. Fourth point is, is to, and I guess this piggybacks a bit on what others have said, is to really bolster the connections between Geneva and capitals. Right? And I think one of my takeaways from MC12 is what really made a difference is to bring capitals to Geneva. Uh, so there are, and this is work that Bob Wolf and I have been doing uh, is it, there are clearly disconnects on a number of issues between what uh, Geneva thinks, what capitals thinks. And I think elucidating what those differences are and why would really help kind of target what the priority should be looking forward. Uh, now that can be done through all kinds of systems and mechanisms. I would argue part of the reform maybe needs to be to solicit more information, not just from the membership, but also from stakeholders and constituencies the business community, NGOs, right? So currently that's all very ad hoc, but we can systematize that. And I think I would argue to bring much more of that knowledge, much more of the concerns on the table so that the people who are sitting around the table actually have a better sense of what the issues are 
that not only their own constituencies have, but also those in other countries. Let me end there, thanks. Thank you, Bernard. And perhaps um, my last question to you before we turn to the Q&A uh, session. And I would like to remind our participants that you can ask your questions through the Q&A box. Um, Bernard, uh, as Annabelle mentioned, the outcome document refers to the global environmental challenges such as climate change. And of course, we also have the fisheries agreement that puts environmental sustainability at the core of this agreement. Um, given these developments, do you think that there will be a boost to WTO's work on environment and climate related issues and potentially other new areas? Uh, such as carbon pricing, and how would that work look like in your opinion? Just briefly, thank you. I, <clears throat> I would say hopefully yes. Whether it will happen, uh, again, I, I don't know. I think a lot of the direction of travel is unilateral, right? So if I look at the, at the region I'm in myself, in the European Union, Virtually all of the discussion on the carbon border adjusted mechanism has been held in Brussels and among European stakeholders. I would have much rather had that discussion in Geneva among a larger set of countries. So that's why I say hopefully yes. In practice, it hasn't happened yet, at least not to a, in, in, a serious, in a serious manner. I think it's really important to do that because there's many different ways of skinning a cat. Right, and that applies not just to climate change and dealing with climate change, but also other types of regulatory policies. So if the notion is everybody needs to price carbon and use a system which is close to those of a major entity like the European Union, I think we're heading for trouble, right? Because clearly many countries are using different types of approaches. They're using regulation. Um, in some countries, you're going to have firms that actually use technologies that might not even be required by the government and that are better than anything you know, the European Union has, just to give an example in terms of the carbon footprint, that should be accepted. So I think what is really needed, and I think this is where I think it goes to your question, you need to have places where you actually talk through the technical dimensions of this. At the end of the day, it's going to boil down to the type of concerns we have already addressed in the food value chain, right? which is about traceability. We're going to need that for the environment. We're going to need that also for labor standards, if I take another example of something that is hot in the European Union at the moment. So I think it is a general issue beyond climate, but I think it's particularly fraught for climate precisely because of the focus on pricing as that's the way forward, whereas that is not necessarily the case. So I think that really needs to be worked out. Um, so where it all comes down is essentially establishing equivalence. Right? We need to have systems and mechanisms in place to determine who's equivalent in terms of not just objectives, but also in terms of policies that are in place to achieve those objectives. And I think WTO could very well be the place to do that, but I am not going to bet much money on it actually happening. So I very much hope that people like Annabelle can, can make it happen. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you very much to all of you for these insightful comments. Let's now turn to the Q&A session. We have received um, quite a few questions. So I will read out a few of them, or rather I will summarize uh, a few of them, and I will give the floor to each of you in the reverse order to answer those questions. So I think there were a few questions. People were intrigued about the sunset clause in the agreement on fishery subsidies. And um, there are questions about the origin of, these, of, of this clause because it was not uh, in the latest draft of the agreement that was presented to members before MC12. There is another question about the outcomes on a dispute settlement. Uh, the person is asking to explain the, whether the solution will be reached by 2024. Um, we have a question about the importance of the e-commerce moratorium on the ground, uh, given that it is unenforceable in the WTO and not backed up by a ban or internal fiscal uh, by a ban on internal uh, discriminations. Uh, and we also have a question about the opt-out tactic uh, in the TRIPS, uh, TRIPS agreement decision that Annabelle mentioned. 
and whether it could help break the deadlock on the cross-cutting issue of special and differential treatment. And questions keep on coming, but uh, if we could start perhaps with those. Uh, Bernard, uh, I think each of you will have about two minutes, so please choose the questions that you like or that you would like to, uh, to address first. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. So some of the questions are really dealing with specifics uh, in terms of what drove negotiations on Chernobyl, and others could address those. On the moratorium, I think it does matter because it's an important signal that we're not going to roll back um, in the area in an area where there is huge potential for growth and, and development, right? And that's the whole digital. Uh, economy and the focus, the problem with the moratorium is it's, it's very undefined, it's open ended. You know, what are electronic transmissions? How do you actually operationalize that? Is something which is very unclear. And, and presumably, that's also why we have an ongoing negotiation in e commerce to try and help also figure that out. On sunset, I think the question was is this a unique thing? And, and the answer is clearly no, right? We had a sunset arrangement in the subsidies and countervailing duty. Um, in the SCM agreements, right, which dealt with actually subsidies for, for regional development, for environments, and that was there for four years, and it was exactly the same type of language that we have in the fisheries agreement, that if not renewed, it dies. It was not renewed and it died, right, and I think that was a huge mistake, uh, but that, that's, that's another story. Uh, I think the opt-out mechanism that were used for China in terms of China as a developing country versus China invoking uh, the right to what is essentially special and differential treatment um, is, I think, the, the way forward. I think it's been done before. I think this is the first time it's formally in, in an agreement, but that clearly is the pragmatic way out of the box that WTO members have put themselves in for way too long as needs in my in my opinion on doing ministerials more frequently absolutely right so i think that that is a proposal that definitely deserves to be considered seriously um and let me stop there thank you very much bernard peter thank you um there's one question that's kind of addressed to me which is about the annual ministerial conferences. I think in principle, it's a good idea. We were kind of discussing this before the session went live. And it's, it's, I think it's clear that, that the ministerial conferences have become too big and too important and, and, and scaling them down and having them more frequently may do that. And it may also support what I was saying about the need to continue engagement. Because if people meet every year, then they're more likely to be engaged than if they meet every five years or two years, as it's supposed to be. Um, so on, on that one, um, that, that's my thought. A quick point, another question on special and differential treatment. Um, is it time to rethink the category um, I think it's obvious that it's long overdue. The problem is that politically it's very unlikely to happen because at the moment the political view amongst developing countries is that they don't want to be subdivided. And there have been all sorts of ways of doing it. The, the proposal um, from 2008 on, on to, in the agriculture negotiations did not um, necessarily distinguish between, they did not say that developing countries are different, but there were all sorts of new categories introduced in their small and vulnerable economies, landlocked economies and so on. So in practice, it, it can happen. But I think one of the problems is that, that there is too strong a political opposition to, to splitting developing countries, which I think is, is sad and, and a mistake, but that's the reality. Thank you very much, Peter. Victor, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, and uh, Irina, let me say I'm reading some of the questions uh, here, and, and I'm impressed by the level of the questions. I'm also impressed by the level of the audience. I saw questions by uh, Giorgio Sacerdoti, our good friend, uh, professor, former fellow body uh, member, by uh, Rod Abbott, who was a former uh, DDG, so I'm thrilled to uh, to know that they are uh, watching this uh, this panel. Uh, I think Bernard uh, replied some of the, the questions I'm not going to repeat, just to confirm um, the importance of the moratorium. It's much more political uh, than, than anything. Um, the, the sunset, well, there's some interesting questions and I'll let uh, Annabelle 
she was there, I was not. My understanding was uh, that this was one of uh, the final issues to be uh, agreed as well, um, that it does have um, its origins in, let's put it this way, the lack of other issues that should have been there and were not there. So there was a group of uh, uh, members who insisted uh, on uh, the sunset clause um, as a way to, let's put it this way, pressure uh, improvements in, um, in the agreement. Um, what else? Um, developing countries, there are some interesting questions there. And I do think the opt-out um, provision leads, um, uh, points into a certain direction, which I think is very, very interesting. As I said, um, there were some um, uh, institutions, some tools in our toolbox uh, regarding that, but I think we do have to think more thoroughly about uh, special and differential treatment. Um, dispute settlement uh, clearly uh, papered over. Yes, this was the you know what the traffic could bear, the language that is in there, and I agree with Bernard. I think there needs to be a, some outside the box thinking. Um, I used to say back in you know 2015, 16, if you think that the appellate body five years from now is going to be how it was five years ago, it's not. And it needs to be rethought because the two-tiered system, in my view, is very important. But how that two-tiered system is going to operate is a big question mark. Um, Professor Sacerdoti asks about the Secretariat. This is something that is uh, dear to my heart, myself having been in the Secretariat. Um, I know Pascal Lamy talks a, a lot about uh, giving more power to the Secretariat. This is something that was also in some of the past reports by wise uh, people. Uh, there was the um, Sutherland report, there was the uh, Warwick report also uh, preached giving more power to the Secretariat. Um, I think we need to think closely about this. It's not as obvious as it can, uh, as, as it can sound. So I guess I'll leave it there. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for the uh, fantastic questions uh, and for the opportunity. Thank you, Victor. Um, Annabelle, questions keep on coming in the meantime, and I think there are a few that you would be best placed to address. Uh, one of them is on the future work of WTO on trade and gender, um, as well as the question that Victor has just picked up on regarding the role of the WTO secretariat. And the question is, whether in light of the ambitious agenda that lies ahead of the WTO, the Secretariat is sufficiently empowered, willing, and able uh, to carry out that work on WTO reform. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Irina, and, uh, and thanks to all the great uh, questions. Uh, indeed, I'd like to briefly touch upon uh, uh, several of them uh, without so I want to say like a caveat uh, to, to my answers, which is that I'm not going to overread too much into or, or, you know, or please do not read overread too much into what I say, but I do think these are interesting uh, developments. Uh, it has been mentioned on the opt out technique that was included in footnote one uh, of the um, intellectual property deal. Uh, it, it is true that this is something that had been discussed before, but the fact that it was negotiated bilaterally between the US and China, and that was put into agreement is an important uh, element. Again, I'm not, I, I don't want to overread into this, but I do think that this is quite uh, relevant. Second, Article 12 of the Fisheries Deal, uh, which refers to uh, termination uh, of the agreement, if comprehensive disciplines are not adopted. I think this is also a very interesting development because, uh, you know, it, in the discussion in the fisheries uh, negotiation was that uh, the market uh, at the time was only ready uh, to, to go with one set of disciplines and they decided to pursue an incremental step uh, to this approach. But there were other members, particularly the African, uh, Caribbean and Pacific countries who wanted uh, stronger disciplines to, uh, to be included. And they were unhappy uh, about, the, uh, about the fact that this was this decision to try to move incrementally. So as a result, to try to accommodate you know, the interest for stronger disciplines, it was agreed to include this fairly radical uh, provision that says 
you know, four years from now, if there are no comprehensive uh, rules developed, this agreement will be terminated unless the general council decides otherwise. I think this is really a powerful incentive. If members want to keep the disciplines in this area, they will need to do more. And these are the kind of positive interactions that need to be built in the agreements uh, in order to incentivize members to move uh, forward. Um, there's also a question by Rafael Leal on climate actions. Again, you know, if you read the outcome document, it, it says basically, you know, it, it speaks about the importance of these uh, issues. But just before the ministerial and in many other ministerials before it, there were many members who were totally adamant against uh, including uh, reference to uh, climate change or to other environmental issues in the context of trade negotiations. So the fact that this comes together for the first time in the outcome document, again, without overreading you know, too much into it, is again a positive uh, signal. And the one, finally, the one that I want to comment on is the role of the secretariat, because uh, I, I, I can, you know, I was involved since November last year uh, until March this year in a in a very very um, sort of engaging process with uh, with the four members uh, uh, in the European Union, India, South Africa, and the United States uh, to try to find convergence on the issue of the intellectual property waiver. This was a very very complex uh, discussions. They resulted in an outcome document that, at the end of the day, provided a strong basis. Um, uh, for the outcome that was finally reached in the context of MC12. Um, that, that role of the secretariat uh, uh, working together with the director and the intellectual property division, uh, I think really was uh, absolutely critical uh, to achieving an outcome in this area. Whether you like the outcome or not, that's a, a different issue and people have many different views. It's a, many con uh, a very contentious issue. So I do think the secretariat has uh, have the resources, uh, the certainly the human resources, the capabilities. I think the director general is very much um, uh, supportive of uh, uh, you know the secretariat being even more helpful to members uh, as they you know as they prepare for dialogues on these issues or they, as they strengthen the, the, the deliberative function of the uh, WTO. Uh, and this is an incremental process, and we will see uh, where this uh, takes us. So to me, I see MC12 beyond the headlines, you know, as really sort of you know, seeding some interesting institutional developments that if, you know, properly taken care of uh, could really help us uh, in moving forward, um, you know, as, as we tackle some of those uh, very important issues that of course are still outstanding in the process of WTO reform. Thank you very much, Annabelle. I think we all agree that members at MC12 achieved much more than we were hoping for, but there is still a lot of work lying ahead of us the second wave of negotiations on the fisheries agreement. Members need to decide whether ex to extend the TRIPS decision to uh, diagnostics and therapeutics, um, not to mention, of course, all the work that needs to be done on uh, WTO reform. Um, I think our time is up and we need to close this session today. Um, so I would like to thank to our experts who have taken time from their extremely busy schedule to, um, to, to attend this event today. And thank you, of course, to all the attendees and to everyone who asked questions. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to you, Geraldo, and to the Society of International Economic Law for organizing this event. Um, I give you the floor to close the session. Thank you very much, Rina. Thanks so much for the moderation. Uh, this was great. And thanks to all the participants contributions. Uh, our next CEO conversation is, will take place in July. We're wrapping it up, the, the organization, and it's going to be about sanctions. So that's also hopefully going to draw a lot of attention. Uh, we had over uh, 200 uh, participants on this one, and this will be uh, recorded. This has is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, two other things you can do, you can follow CEONet on Twitter. Uh, and, and then uh, you can also become CEO members and you get our newsletter. Uh, thank you so much for everyone, uh, to everyone. Thanks, Irina, and uh, see you on the next CEO conversation. Thank you.